These were the end times. The world is no more, torn apart by treachery and chaos. And yet, endings beget beginnings. Listen carefully. Can you hear it? The cruel laughter of dark gods. It dances on the winds between worlds, striving to be heard. For the ruinous powers bore easily, and they seek tirelessly for new realities to conquer. Where there is life, chaos will find it, and misery and bloodshed will soon follow. The world is gone, but all may not be lost. The descendants of the old ones left before the chaos moon destroyed their homelands, that much is certain. But where did they go? And if they escaped, did anyone else? Can what is dead ever truly die? Who remains lost in the void? To what does he cling? And when a world dies, what happens next? Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. I've done many topics over the course of this series, and I've never been shy about tackling a controversial point in my own fashion. But this may be my hardest challenge yet. I'm going to try and play Devil's Advocate for Age of Sigmar. Pray for my soul, good brothers and sisters. To explain why this is a daunting task, I need to set the clock back a few years to the infamous End Times event that happened in Warhammer Fantasy Battle, coinciding with a series of supplements that combine several armies, expand the rules, and destroyed the whole world. I'm not going to go into full details on everything that happened within it, as that's a matter better covered by other people. In the eyes of many, the way the event ended felt like GW, Games Workshop, throwing the Fantasy Battle series under the bus, doubly so when its follow-up, Age of Sigmar, was presented as a successor, leading to many claiming that GW just wanted more Space Marines in other properties, not an unfounded claim, as GW does have a Space Marine problem. It seems now they've learned from their mistake with the return of the old world, but time will tell how that shakes out. Suffice to say, it was easy to become cynical about the whole affair. Well, I certainly was, since I moved my table over to Ninth Age for a while instead, while I grew perplexed at this newfangled Age of Sigmar. Problem is, Age of Sigmar was the epitome of a bad first impression. The idea was clearly to try and have a less codex-centric game that aimed more towards skirmish battles and narrative encounters, but the nuance was so lacking to make it almost unplayable. Not helping matters were army rules that were woefully inadequate, almost something that one would expect in a parody. Unfortunately, in more recent years, the setting has begun to be taken a little bit more seriously by GW, and because of that, I think the hatred has died down a little. There'll still be stalwarts on it, but... The attitude now is that it's not complete shit. Personally, I think the biggest mistake was treating this as a successor right after a long-running entry was deleted from official support. When I saw the art, I saw a setting that evoked a feeling akin to heavy metal album covers, and I felt that should have been emphasized, which it kind of was later on. Truth be told, I must credit Arvandus for why I gave Age of Sigmar a second look. So when it was announced that Cubicle 7 would handle an RPG for the setting, I stated publicly on the Monastery that I would give a look on faith that Seed 7 could make it something workable, given their past output with things like Doctor Who, Lone Wolf, and most recently, Warhammer Fantasy. Well, now the time has come to pay that proverbial piper. How does it hold up? Let's find out. At 352 pages, Soulbound is a beefy book with a very marbled feel. Those who are familiar with Cubicle 7's visual presentation will find familiar ground here, and the art is of the quality one might expect from them. I have very few nitpicks about the visual presentation, aside from the moments where you have, to te where you have text over a full-page illustration. I've never been a fan of that kind of thing, but that is the splittingest of splitting hairs. And of course, there's the all-important index. Good stuff all around. Characters here are the champions of the mortal realms, routed together by a purpose of one form or another. Now we'll be exploring this with a Stormcast Eternal named Arstadeus. 
Step one is archetype. This determines the starting attributes, species, skills, and so on. Now, obviously, we'll be going with the Stormcast Eternal, a formerly human soul that's been reforged into a living weapon through the Cosmic Storm. In this regard, they can be considered post you more than anything else, leading to their affectionate nickname of Sigmarines. This allows for four potential starting points for us, and of these, we'll go with the Knight Azeros, a lantern-bearing knight that's as much of a warrior as they are an emissary filling a cleric-like role in other games. Step two is skills. Skill use is not static in Stoolbound, and is split between training and focus, which we'll get into later. Each archetype begins with a single core skill that has a rank of one of each in training and focus, and seven XP to spend on skills listed in their archetype. We'll go with one training in determination, and one each in awareness, reflexes, and weapon skill. Step 3 is Talents. Much like skills, we have a core talent that we gain for free, in this case Blessed, but we also have a short list of talents to choose from. We'll be going with Iron Will, Celestial Strike, and Light of Sigmar. The latter two are considered miracles, and I'll delve into the nitty-gritty of that later on. Step 4 is Equipment, which is preset based on the archetype. In our case, we have Sigmarite Plate, granting an armor of two, a Star Blade, a Dagger, Celestial Wings, a Celestial Beacon, acting as our holy symbol, and 45 drops of Aqua Giranis. Lastly, Derive Stats. We'll start with the three combat abilities of Melee, Accuracy, and Defense. This is calculated based on the sum of an attribute and the training based on the ability. Melee is Body plus Weapon Skill, Accuracy is Mind plus Ballistic Skill, and Defense is Body plus Reflexes. Now, calculating each of these, we have a rating of average in melee and defense, and poor in accuracy. Next is toughness, which is calculated from the sum of your three attributes, resulting in 10 thanks to the Iron Will talent. After that is initiative, which is the sum of mind and the combined training and awareness and reflexes, making it 4 in our case. Lastly, metal, which can be used to fuel miracles and specific talents, and is equal to half of the soul attribute, in our case, 2. Character creation is something that might appear a little limited at first, with the only real picks being within skills and talents. Now fortunately, for those who do find it more limiting, there is the option for freeform character creation, even an option of making it more low fantasy as an approach if you so choose. Soulbound uses a d6 dice pool, similar to Wrath and Glory. While the die pool used is the sum total of attributes and skills, the target you roll against is not exactly static. Instead, it's split between difficulty and complexity. Difficulty determines the minimum die face that counts as a success, while complexity is the number of successes you need for the action to, well, succeed. Now, the focus part of skills allows you to skew these results, granting a plus one bonus to, that can be applied to a single die result, or a multiple die at higher focus levels. So if you have three focus in a given skill, you could apply it to all into one die, two into one, and one into, into another, or one into three die. And while I'd mentioned previously that metal is used for fuel for certain talents and miracles, it can also be used to take extra actions in combat, to double roll skill modifiers, i.e. double their training rating or focus ratings, but not both, and Despite metal being a small resource, it's more akin to momentum than any sort of extra effort system, since you regain metal completely at the start of each combat round. In other words, it's like the maneuver thing that D&D 5th Edition abandoned. The narrative sense of an extra effort mechanic would take the form of Soulfire and Doom. Soulfire is a shared resource among all player characters that allows for greater effects such as turning a roll into full boxcars, recovering toughness, or even cheating death. Doom, conversely, represents the presence that chaos has within a given area, and can be used by the GM as a metal equivalent. Now, combat is more narrativist than its contemporaries, focusing on broadly defined zones like in Fate rather than the traditional grid setup. The difficulty number is based on the difference between the attacker's melee or accuracy rating and the defender's defense ability. 
increasing it if the latter is higher and decreasing it if the former is. Armor can be thought of as complexity in this regard in order to inflict damage. Now, wounds still take effect after your normal health is depleted, but do not have the chart-based approach as in other Warhammer games. Instead, you have a wound track based on the excess damage. One damage is a minor wound and fills one space on the wound track. Two to four damage is a serious wound and fills two spaces. And five or more is a deadly wound and fills three spaces. Now, given how Soulbound is aiming for epic scaling, going for a more abstract feel makes sense here. Fortunately, it's not entirely a cakewalk, as damage numbers can add up quickly. Now, that said, I do think that the way Soulbound is presented might have a bit of a relearning experience for those who prefer crunchier games. As I mentioned before, this has more in common with the likes of Fate, or Ten Revanche Zero, or the majority of the games that are narrative-leaning, but not entirely story games. I do think the Endeavor mechanic helps add to the narrative aspect by giving some attention to downtime activity. Now, to its credit, there are options to add more grit if your table wants to, but the use of split um, skill ratings might come a bit contentious to some. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the more casting-centric parts of skill Soulbound. So let's do that. Magic is safer in Soulbound than in fantasy roleplay. Kind of. Now note that I said safer and not safe. Like in the aforementioned case, most magic is going to be based around the winds. Doubly so since each of the winds of magic has their own realm all to themselves, as well as the powerful but dangerous materials called realmstone, a kind of evolution of warpstone from the old world. Regardless, the act of actually casting a spell is a mind-channeling test, with the difficulty and complexity based on the chosen spell. Extra successes can be applied to the spell's overcast effect in this regard while failure creates a backlash. When this happens, you roll a number of die equal to the difference between the spell's complexity and the successes that you got, if you ended up getting any successes, that is. After this, you consult the price of failure chart. Now again, while it's technically safer in the sense that an exploding head or getting sucked into chaos isn't likely, the worst that can happen is summoning a living incarnation of magic called an endless spell. As a final note, I should mention that characters can take multiple spellcasting lores, with each one being more expensive and having greater requirements. Miracles can be considered spell-like effects, but trade versatility for reliability. Now, miracles do not typically require a dice roll to determine their success, but they may cost metal to use instead. In some cases, this is by default, while others allow you to add metal to the miracle to sustain its effects or amplify them. This may sound like miracles have an advantage, but remember that spell lores, once you buy into a spell lore, automatically grant four spells, while the blessed talent only grants one miracle, and you cannot gain blessed more than once. I like that spells and miracles don't work exactly the same way mechanically. Yes, I know that all magic is chaos magic, but having it use different mechanics is a good way to establish an identity. Speaking of which, having a section just to making spells is a welcome addition especially since there's no reason to have spellbook logic when the winds of magic are more pronounced here. I'll miss the risk of spellcasting in the, in the old world, but it makes up for it in other ways. As I mentioned at the start, I initially wanted to cover Soulbound out of the faith I had that Cubicle 7 could make it into something as long as Games Workshop left them alone. While this game definitely has some growing to do, I think they have a proper understanding of what they're going for with Soulbound and how they intend to use the setting of Age of Sigmar in it. While it's true that this is a simplified version of the mechanics used in Wrath and Glory, I'd chalk that up to coincidence, as originally that game was under a separate company. Moreover, Soulbound needed to be abstract. You can't necessarily go as over-the-top as this game does within the confines of a fairly crunchy setting. But what puts it over-the-top is that it's not limited to do just that mechanically. Soulbound aims to be a true sandbox with how its optional rules are presented. Ultimately, whether you choose to go with it is going to depend on where you stand on the proverbial fluff-crunch alignment chart. If you lean towards fluff, you'll get on great with this one. If you lean towards crunch, a little less so. As for me personally, Soulbound gets a stamp of strongly recommended. I suspected that Age of Sigmar would fit better in a role-playing game than in a skirmish war game, 
and while the war game part has improved, I was mostly right on that. I do want to emphasize that this is a strong start, but it's still a start. Its true test will be how it's supported, especially with the multitude of realms within the setting. Time will tell how that shakes out.